Hi, everybody, and welcome back for another chapter of Sri Nisargadatta Maharaja's I Am Bat. And today we will be looking at chapter 97. Mind and the world are not separate. Mind and the world are not separate. They are one. I see here pictures of several saints. And I am told that they are your spiritual ancestors. Who are they? And how did it all begin? We are called collectively the nine masters. The legend says that our first teacher was Rishi Dattatreya, the great incarnation of the Trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Even the nine masters, Navnaf, are mythological. What is the peculiarity of their teaching? In simplicity, it's simplicity, both in theory and practice. So it's very simple. Of course, uh, Nisargadatta, uh, Nisarga, means natural. So he was even called Mr. Natural in a sense, right? But natural, simple, what's real, what's easy, what doesn't need effort because it's already the way it is. <laughs> So how does one become a Navnath, by initiation or by succession? Neither. The nine masters tradition, Navnath Param, Parampara, is like a river. It flows into the ocean of reality, and whoever enters it is carried along. Does it imply acceptance by a living master, belonging to the same tradition? Those who practice the sadhana of focusing their minds on I am, may feel related to others who have followed the same sadhana and succeeded. They may decide to verbalize their sense of kinship by calling themselves navnaths. It gives them the pleasure of belonging to an established tradition. Do they in any way benefit by joining? The circle of satsang, the company of saints, expands in numbers as time passes. Do they get hold thereby of a source of power and grace from which they would have been barred otherwise? Power and grace are for all and for the asking. Power and grace are for all and for the asking. Giving oneself to a particular name does not help. Call yourself by any name. As long as you are intensely mindful of yourself, the accumulated obstacles to self-knowledge are bound to be swept away. If I like your teaching and accept your guidance, can I call myself a Navnath? Please, your word-addicted mind, the name will not change you. The name will not change you. At best, it may remind you to behave. There is a succession of gurus and their disciples, who in turn train more disciples, and thus the line is maintained. But the continuity of tradition is informal and voluntary. It is like a family name, but here the family is spiritual. Do you have to realize to join the Sampradaya? The Navnath Sampradaya is only a tradition a way of teaching and practice. It does not denote a level of consciousness. If you accept a Navnath Sampradaya teacher as your guru, you join his Sampradaya. Usually you receive a token of his grace, a look, a touch, or a word, sometimes a vivid dream or a strong remembrance. Sometimes the only sign of grace is a significant and rapid change in character and behavior, in character and behavior. I know you now for some years, and I meet you regularly. The thought of you is never far from my mind. Does it make me belong to your Sampradaya? <laughs> your belonging is a matter of your own feeling and conviction. After all, it is all verbal and formal. 
in reality, there is neither guru nor disciple, neither theory nor practice, neither ignorance nor realization. It all depends on what you take yourself to be. It all depends on what you take yourself to be. How do you define yourself? Who am I? I am this, I am that. How do you see yourself? Know yourself correctly. There is no substitute for self-knowledge. So know what you are, know what you are not. What proof will I have that I know myself correctly? You need no proofs. The experience is unique and unmistakable. It will dawn on you suddenly when the obstacles are removed to some extent. It is like a frayed rope snapping. Yours is to work at the strands. The break is bound to happen. It can be delayed, but not prevented. It can't be prevented because remember, we're not trying to attain unity. Unity is. That is the essence of what is oneness. That's the reality. There is variety and difference, but no separation. Advaita, not two. So everything is already one. The problem is, because we have this mental concept, mental self-image playing, we don't see it, we don't realize it. But as soon as this I dissolves and disappears, what is left? Oneness. It's always been there, but of course, we can't see it because we are there. As Papaji said to Muji, right before Muji awakened, he said, if you want reality, you must disappear. The seeker must disappear. And this seems very odd or opposite to what we might think. I am seeking and I will find, but it's not like that. The I that is seeking is the issue. The I is what's getting in the way. So if you want reality, the I must die. The I must disappear. And remember, you can only lose what you are not. So don't be afraid to lose the I. Because again, remember, it's not a thing. It's not like you have it and then you lose it. It's a verb. It's a process. The brain is creating a sense of self. But it's just a sense. It's not an actual thing. I am confused by your denial of causality. Does it mean that none is responsible for the world as it is? The idea of responsibility is in your mind. The idea of responsibility is in your mind. You think there must be something or somebody solely responsible for all that happens. There is a contradiction between a multiple universe and a single cause. Either one or the other must be false, or both. As I see it, it is all daydreaming. It is all a dream. There is no reality in ideas. The fact is that without you, neither the universe nor its cause could have come into being. So you are the primary thing or no thing. You being what? Awareness, beingness, consciousness, the ultimate perceiver, the white screen, the absolute supreme reality. I cannot make out whether I'm the creature or the creator of the universe. I am. I am is an ever-present fact. While I am created is an idea. Neither God nor the universe have come to tell you that they have created you. <laughs> Very good. The mind, obsessed by the idea of causality, invents creation and then wonders, hmm, who is the creator? The mind itself 
is the creator. The mind itself is the creator. Mm. The mind itself is the creator. Even this is not quite true, for the created and the creator are one. Creator, creation are one. The mind and the world are one, are not separate. Do understand that what you think to be the world is your own mind. The key word is think. What you think to be the world is only a thought in your mind. Is there a world beyond or outside the mind? All space and time are in the mind. Space, time, in the mind. Where will you locate a supramental world? There are many levels of the mind and each projects its own version. Yet, all are in the mind and created by the mind. So, no mind, no world, no self, no thing. Emptiness, emptiness, emptiness. And this is how, if you really look out at the seven billion people and you listen to what they say and you listen to them speak, you can tell they are just speaking about their mental perception of reality. I believe this. The world was created this way, and this is what the world is, and this is what the world isn't, and this is my model. This is my model of the world. And every human being, in a sense, most of them, have this model or this image of the world in their brain, in their mind. And within that image, there's self-image, image of God. So it's all conceptual. It's all conceptual. But you are beyond concepts. You are not a thought. You are the space in which thoughts appear and disappear. You are the awareness of the thoughts that appear and disappear. So what happens? Formless consciousness is in the body, and as the body gets older, that formless consciousness begins to identify with the body. So it contracts. It's no longer the spacious, vast consciousness. Now it's contracting and it's saying, oh, I am this body. I am a person. I am this self-image. And everything becomes smaller and limited. And what happens? Suffering. Suffering happens because we are no longer living our truth, if you will. We are living something that's false, small, conceptual, created by mind. And everything becomes I and other, and the mind compartmentalizes everything in the world and has a judgment or an opinion about everything that is perceived. What is your attitude? What is your attitude to sin? How do you look at a sinner, somebody who breaks the law, inner or outer? Do you want him to change or you just pity him? Or are you indifferent to him because of his sins? I know no sin. I know no sinner. Your distinction and valuation do not bind me. Everybody behaves according to his nature. It cannot be helped, nor need it be regretted. Everybody behaves according to his nature. Everybody behaves according to his nature. 
everybody behaves according to his nature. It cannot be helped, nor need it be regretted. Remember, from the standpoint of oneness, there are no problems. This moment is the perfect expression of oneness. Was it in this video? Maybe the one right before I was speaking about uh, North Korea and Donald Trump. And forgive me, I forget this gentleman's name. But so in a sense, they are just being who they are. Now, we can only be who we are, too. So it doesn't mean we just let people do whatever. In other words, everyone's just going to do what they do. Some people will try to fight. Some people will try to pray. Some people will meditate. Everybody will respond to suffering and evil and violence in the world according to their own nature. It's just how it is. And it cannot be helped, nor need it be helped, from the sense of the absolute, from the sense, uh, from the perspective of the formless. Because again, remember, all forms, anything that's born, it's going to die. Anything that's born is going to die. Birth and death have that relationship. But life itself has no opposite. Life is eternal. The absolute supreme, it's beyond being and non-being. And there's absolutely no problem in oneness. All is well at the bottom of the ocean. It is silent and still. At the top, in the shallow parts, that's where all the mental activity and the conflict and the fighting and the I and other is happening. But as that dissolves, as we go deeper, and deeper and deeper into the heart of the beloved, we see that there is only one. It's impossible to have conflict. What looks like conflict, what looks, appears to be two, is one. One thing happening. All there is, is one. Advaita, not two. There is no separation. There is variety and difference. Great play. In the movie, there are many characters. You have the hero and the villain and the protagonist and the antagonist and the good guy and the bad guy and all of this variety and difference. It's entertaining. It's entertaining. Why is there suffering? To thicken the plot is what one Zen Buddhist master said. Why is there suffering? To thicken the plot. That's the drama. That's the drama. And the mind loves the drama. It's very entertaining. But after a while, that suffering either becomes boring because it's quite repetitious, or it just becomes too painful. And then we begin to seek for the truth. We begin to seek for liberation, freedom from suffering. God, I no longer wish to suffer. Maybe I wanted to suffer for a while, but now I don't want to suffer. First question God will ask us, who are you? Do you know who you are? Do you know what you are? Who is this I that is suffering? And as we examine the I and look for an I, look for a self, we find, well, we find that we don't find a self. We see that there is nothing here. This is emptiness. This is nothing appearing as something, but it's only the appearance of something. There's no little person in the brain riding the bicycle or making the choices. Even science can show us this now. Would you like chocolate or vanilla? I want chocolate. So the ego thinks, I made that choice, but we can see in the brain activity, the brain scans, that the choice is made prior to the body saying, I want chocolate. So again, this is why we need to have healthy brain activity though. 
why it's so important to eat well and live well and meditate and serve and love and chant and do japa and mantra because we want to purify this brain because so much is happening originating from the brain and from the heart. Purify thyself. Know thyself. So others suffer. Life lives on life. That's how it is. Life lives on life. In nature, the process is compulsory. In society, it should be voluntary. There can be no life without sacrifice. A sinner refuses to sacrifice and invites death. This is as it is and gives no cause for condemnation or pity. Surely you feel at least compassion when you see a man steeped in sin. Yes, I feel compassion. I feel I am that man and his sins are my sins because there's no separation. There's no other. Nisargadatta has said, I can focus on someone and I can experience their consciousness because there's no separation. When you're at the level, we could say of Nisargadatta, when there is no separation, then everything, the energy, the consciousness of everything can be perceived because there's no more filter, there's no more boundaries, there's no more separation. By my becoming one with him, he becomes one with me. It is not a conscious process. It happens entirely by itself. It happens entirely by itself. None of us can help it. What needs changing shall change anyhow. Enough to know oneself as one is, here and now. Intense and methodical investigation into one's mind is yoga. Intense and methodical investigation into one's mind, into one's heart, into one's awareness and beingness and consciousness is yoga. What needs changing shall change anyhow. So know yourself. Know yourself. Know what you are. Know what you are not. Okay. Thank you, Nisargadatta Maharaj. Thank you, Nisargadatta Maharaj. Om Namah Shivaya. Thank you, everybody. We're coming to the end. Only a few more chapters left of Sri Nisagadatta Maharaja's I Am That. Have a good day. <laughs> bye bye.